Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of MMT Mondays. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. We all grew up hearing that famous phrase in the Declaration of Independence. That's the day that we became America, right? Some of you may not realize it, but we have two different Independence Days. We all know how we celebrate July 4th, 1776 as the day that we declared our independence from Great Britain and when actual history began, right? (laughs) My question to you is how can we celebrate our independence from a country when all of the people living in the nation weren't actually free? At the time of the original signing of the Declaration, our population was nearly 2.5 million people. Of that number, slaves made up 20% or 500,000 of the population, even though they were considered property. (laughs) While I'm at it, let's take a quick aside and go back to that phrase, all men are created equal, because this completely plays into our main theme of today's episode. This phrase sounds great and wonderful, but is very misleading. At this time, if you were a woman, you were considered property of your husband. If you were a Native American, you were considered a savage, that would be killed or forced off your land. We already discussed how slaves were considered property. And finally, if you were a lower class white male that didn't own land, you weren't considered a full citizen either. Essentially, all men are created equal should have said all rich land owning white men are created equal. (laughs) That's my TED talk, thank you for coming and y'all have a great week. But back to our regularly scheduled programming. While most people view July 4th as Independence Day, Juneteenth is considered Independence Day for African Americans since that is the day that slavery truly ended. June 19th, 1865 is the day that the Union Army arrived in Texas and physically forced the ending of slavery. Now, believe it or not, and unlike what you read in your textbooks, the Confederacy didn't want to obey the laws. Crazy concept, I know, right? Who would have thought that? But speaking of what you don't read about in your textbooks, the month of June represents an anniversary of another type of liberation nearly a century after Juneteenth. On June 28, 1969, the Stonewall Uprising took place where police raided a popular LGBTQ bar in New York City. The New York City police were famous for raiding suspected LGBTQ bars during that time as a way to enforce the discriminatory laws targeted at that community. Outside of the bar, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera saw a cop reaching for his gun and hit him in the head with a trash can lid to protect their friends. The subsequent riot that took place served as a catalyst for the gay rights movement of the 70s and still to this day. Both the Stonewall Riot and Juneteenth are viewed as a liberation day for two different marginalized communities. While they are both days of celebration, They are also both days of reflection about what still needs to be done in both communities. In our first example, we see a story from Alabama that thankfully doesn't talk about some backward law or policy being passed in the state. In this video, local AL.com reporter Star Dunnigan explains the history behind how Juneteenth became a national holiday and why it is such a mystery to so many people today. Some of you may not be aware of this, but America actually has two Independence Days. One celebrates America's freedoms from Britain's rule. Another holiday, Juneteenth, commemorates the day when a Union general came into Texas and gave an order that actually ended slavery. Now, you may be going to yourself like, wait, did an Emancipation Proclamation take care of that? And my answer to you is this. You actually thought the Confederate States obeyed the law. Okay, sure. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln declared all slaves held in Confederate states to be free. But that news never reached the Texas slaves and there's many theories as to why. Maybe someone literally murdered the messenger that was sent to Texas to inform them. Maybe in typical Confederate fashion, they withheld them information from the slaves. Some historians believe that since the Civil War wasn't over yet, that the lack of Union Army presence in Texas made it hard for Lincoln's proclamation to be enforced. Nonetheless, it was cotton picking business as usual in Texas despite the proclamation. Some slave owners in neighboring states moved their slaves to Texas because they thought that the Confederate Army would eventually win the war, and when it was over, they could get their property back. 
So when Union General Gordon Granger rode into Galveston, Texas with Union soldiers behind him, and he saw all of these slaves, he decided to make an announcement on June 19th, 1865. First off, a proclamation was made from the president to free all these slaves two and a half years ago. Second off, you are no longer slave owners and slaves, you are employers, and those are your hired workers. Some slaves dipped out of there before Granger could even finish his announcement. Other slaves decided to go and leave the state so that they could repair their families that were torn apart from the slave trade. Others decided to flee up north, and they lived happily ever after, right? No, of course not. By law, they were free men and women, but in reality, they were enslaved by oppression and violence. Black bodies still hung from the branches. Some were even shot for their freedom. But freed men and women wanted to celebrate that they were just that, freed. They created a holiday that was originally called June the 19th, but then it was kind of squeezed together and now it's Juneteenth. When they wanted to celebrate the first annual Juneteenth, segregation laws forbade them from using public spaces. Okay, that's fine. We'll celebrate near rivers and lakes. They dressed in the fanciest clothes so they can combat laws that required them to wear raggedy clothing. They ate barbecues, sung spirituals, preached religious sermons. Strawberry soda was the drink of choice, and they also ate a lot of ripe fruits and desserts such like strawberry pie and red velvet cake to commemorate the blood that was spilt during slavery. These rituals still occur in today's Juneteenth celebrations, whether it be parades, cookouts, or five-day festivals. And since whites didn't want to share their own spaces with blacks, the Blacks decided that they would raise their own funds for their own celebration sites, such as Emancipation Park in Houston, Texas. So as the former Texas slaves decided to migrate across the country, so did the importance of Juneteenth, which is also known as Emancipation Day or Freedom Day. In 1980, Texas was the first state to declare Juneteenth a state holiday when state offices are not closed, but partially staffed. So far, 45 states have recognized the historical significance of Juneteenth. Guess what? Alabama wasn't last this time. Alabama was the 40th state to do so, but it didn't get the same paid state holiday status as Confederate Memorial Day or Robert E. Lee Day. There's also a national campaign to make Juneteenth a federal holiday. Whitewashed textbooks didn't, and still don't, mention Juneteenth. Because of that, a lot of people are still finding out about Juneteenth. So whether you found out about Juneteenth decades ago, a few weeks ago, or even just now, don't worry. There'll be plenty of cookouts, parades, and festivals to celebrate the resiliency of the black community. I'm Star Dunnigan with Reckon. If you like what we're doing, please follow Reckon by AL.com on Facebook or Twitter. You can also subscribe to our newsletter by going to AL.com slash Reckon. Thanks for watching. In our next example, we see this theme of liberation echoed with the events of the Stonewall Riot. Usually the police would raid a suspected LGBTQ bar and arrest a few people. But on June 28, 1969, rather than run away or submit to arrest, they fought back. These people were fighting back to simply be left alone and to assert their right to exist like any other citizen in the country. Like many other instances throughout our nation's history, it took a literal riot to finally force the rest of mainstream America to sit up and listen to the voices of those being oppressed. So this trailer for the movie Stonewall just came out and some folks are upset because it seems like the film glosses over a lot of the folks who were historically important to the Stonewall riots. With everybody talking about Stonewall, it's a perfect opportunity to talk about who was there, why they were fighting, and why it matters. In the 1960s, Greenwich Village, New York was the place to be for queers. It was where all the culture was happening and it was one of the safest places to be out in the whole country. I recently spoke to playwright Robert Patrick about what it was like back then, and here's what he told me. In my first half hour in Manhattan, I wandered into a place called the Cafe Chino, which was a bastion of experimental art, intellectual discovery, and homosexual rebels. There was never a better time to be young than in New York in the 1960s. The Stonewall Inn was a diverse gathering place in Greenwich Village, particularly for street kids, people of color, drag queens, trans people. Folks who were unwelcome anywhere else found a home at the Stonewall Inn. 
And crucially, it suffered fewer police raids than some other bars because it was owned by the mob and they were paying off the cops. Queers were under constant threat of police harassment. You could get arrested for dressing in drag, for serving a drink to a gay person, for touching another man, even for making eye contact for too long. If you got arrested, your name could appear in the newspaper, and then you could lose your home or your job or get kicked out of school. June 28th, 1969. There's a surprise police raid on the Stonewall Inn. Normally, the police would just check everyone's ID, arrest a few people, and then leave. But this night, they started rounding everyone up. Rather than run away or submit to arrest, the victims of the harassment fought back. They threw rocks and bottles, they smashed police cars, and they chased the cops from the neighborhood. Nobody knows for sure who started the riot, but some of the people who were involved include Marsha Johnson, a trans woman who's said to have smashed a police car and Stormé Delarvery, a lesbian who is said to have thrown the first punch, and Sylvia Rivera, a 17-year-old non-binary drag queen. Here's Sylvia four years later, storming the stage at a gay pride celebration. I have lost my job! I have lost my apartment for gay liberation! And you all treat me this way? What the fuck's wrong with you all? One historical figure who does appear to be in the trailer is Frank Kameny, inventor of the phrase gay is good. He was a foundational figure in the LGBT liberation movement years before Stonewall. I was going through his personal papers in the Library of Congress when I stumbled across this ad for the Sewers of Paris, and that's where I got the name for my podcast. So what were they fighting for? to be left alone. These were folks who had been marginalized and entrapped and harassed for years. All they wanted was to be able to gather together in peace. Now, from looking at the Stonewall trailer, you might think that the riots were the first step on the road to marriage equality. But in fact, for many people who were around at the time, it was just the opposite. I recently spoke to Emily Rosenberg, a lesbian activist who was around in the 1970s. People I knew were getting out of marriage. Nobody had the least bit of interest in marriage. It was unattractive. We'd all seen marriage, and we all rejected it. We wanted to shake up the system, and we didn't want to be part of the system. This wasn't about inclusion or being assimilated into heterosexual society. This was about being left alone, free to form your own communities. The Stonewall Riots were one of the first times that large groups of Americans saw that queers were demanding the right to live openly without the fear of institutionalized harassment and violence. After years of being ignored, it took a riot to get the country's attention. I recently spoke to Cleve Jones about queer liberation, and here's what he says he always tells activists. You must demand everything immediately, because only when enough of you demand everything immediately is there any hope of getting anything eventually, you know? We'll find out in September just how much the Stonewall movie gets right. But if we demand representation now, maybe we'll get it eventually. In the meantime, you can check out the project Happy Birthday, Marsha. That's an independent film that tells the stories of the people who were really there that night. Thanks for watching. You can subscribe here on YouTube for more videos on LGBT issues, and you can also check out my other projects at mattbaum.com. As you can see, both Juneteenth and the Stonewall Riots represent days of celebration, but also days of reflection about what still needs to be done in both communities. In his second inaugural address, President Obama referenced the continued fight for gay rights, stating, our journey is not complete until our gay brothers and sisters are treated like anyone else under the law, for if they are truly created equal, then surely the love they commit to one another must be equal as well. Within the last week, Congress passed a law establishing Juneteenth as a federal holiday. Both of these instances appear great on paper, but falter upon further inspection. As we mentioned in a previous episode, members of the LGBTQ community continue to face discrimination in the workplace and continued threats to their overall job security. While Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday is great, many believe it represents nothing more than a symbolic platitude that distracts from the fact that not one piece of legislation has been passed to defund or hell even reform the police. Not one piece of legislation has been passed to counteract sweeping state-led voter restriction laws across the country. Not one piece of legislation has been passed to help bridge the vast gap in racial wealth. When we look at the economy through the lens of MMT, we see that we can easily afford the policies that are needed to make this country more equitable for all instead of housing power in the hands of a few. The first step towards building a more equitable nation starts with actually learning the real history behind events such as Juneteenth and the Stonewall Riot. Only then can we stand in solidarity 
with our LGBTQ and African American brothers and sisters to demand the changes needed to guarantee that famous opening words of the Declaration of Independence and make sure that it actually lives up to its claim that all are created equal. If you enjoyed tonight's video, make sure to check us out at realprogressives.org and subscribe to get notifications on new video streams in YouTube, Periscope, Facebook, and Rockfin. Also, if you wanted to support the work that we do at Real Progressives, make sure to check out our Patreon page where for a few bucks a month, you can support our endeavors. Thank you, and y'all have a great day.